At this time, we will begin the 17th lecture on the prison epistles. The main passages today is Colossians chapter 4. The title of this chapter is Prayer. First, Instructions to Masters, verse 1. Second, Prayer and Evangelization verses 2 through 6. Third, the sending of two people, verses 7 through 9. Fourth, introduction, greetings, and a favor, verses 10 through 18. Read verse 1. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. The first point is instructions to masters. Even if a person is a master, he must not do what is offensive in the eyes of God. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 2 all a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. Our ways may seem right when we look at ourselves, but God weighs our hearts. Masters must provide his slaves with what is right and fair. Also, they must understand the circumstances of the slaves. They must realize that they would one day be judged by God, and therefore they must act in fairness. If a slave sees that a master is not fair, he can make personal suggestions to his master with faithfulness. However, they must leave the results to God. King Saul tried to kill David several times. David suffered while he escaped from the hands of Saul. However, there were many opportunities for David to kill Saul. However, David refused to kill Saul. He handed everything to God. Because he knew that Saul was anointed by God as king, he handed everything over to God. The Bible tells us that all authority is from God. If a master and his slaves fight, both will be destroyed. Even though slaves may seem incompetent in the eyes of a master, he must be patient. He must confront them with love and properly lead the slaves. If he does so, the slaves will one day change. When parents raise their children, they may sometimes not like how their children act. But when they properly lead their children with love, their children will grow up properly. Masters must also know that there is God in heaven and provide their slaves with what is right and fair. The second point, prayer and evangelization, verses 2 through 6. Verse 2. 
devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. We must put prayer as first priority. Prayer is most important because it is a time to talk to God and communicate with Him. When the Israelites were at war with the Amalekites, Moses went up to the mountain to pray to God. The power of prayer empowered Joshua, who was leading the Israelites in the battle. When Moses' hands became tired and began to fall, the Israelites began to lose. However, when Moses prayed with his hands raised, the Israelites began to win the battle. In the same way, believers will receive the power of God when they pray to Him. Without prayer, we cannot accomplish the spiritual tasks. Even Jesus said, this kind can come out only by prayer. Satan tries to take away our prayer time. When our prayer time is taken away, our faith is taken away as well. Then our power is taken away. Then our diligence is taken away. Our love of Jesus decreases. If these things happen, we can no longer practice our faith. We cannot overcome Satan if we do not pray. We must pray every day. It is best for us to set a prayer time in the early mornings. Mark chapter 1 verse 35 It says that Jesus went to a solitary place in a very early morning. Luke chapter 22 verse 39 Jesus prayed on the Mount of Olives as he always did. Jesus who was God practiced a life of prayer, and we must imitate Him. Praying in the early morning is the best time for prayer. We must habitually pray to God. When we do so, we will then receive the grace of God and His power. Also, it says that we must devote ourselves to prayer by being watchful and thankful. First, we must thank God for His grace. We must pray with thankfulness, with faith, that God will continue to give us the best things. It also says that we must pray by being watchful. This means that we must pray in spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit. We must pray through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the truth. Verse 3, And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. It says pray for us too. 
us refers to Paul and other pastors. Believers must cooperate with their pastors by praying for them. Here, the prayer request is this, that God may open a door for our message. We must pray that pastors would properly preach God's word. When believers pray for pastors, pastors can courageously share the gospel. Pastors are a spiritual vessel of life between God and believers. There is a golden pipe between the olive tree and the lampstand, and the oil passes through the pipe. Pastors are like a golden pipe. The oil of the grace of God is given to believers through pastors. If the pipe is blocked, they cannot receive grace and oil. Therefore, believers must always pray for pastors, cooperate with them, and receive the grace of God. Then God will pour out His grace on pastors so that they could properly preach God's word. If pastors work alone, they may become exhausted and fatigued. Moses' hands came down because he was tired. However, Aaron and Hur held Moses' hands on each side, and Moses' hands did not come down until the war was over. They cooperated with and helped Moses. Through their cooperation, the Israelites won the war. Some people dangle on the arms of pastors. When the pastor is tired because he works for God, some people make him even more tired. Unlike them, we must cooperate with and uphold our pastor's arms. However, there are people who pull down on their arms. If that is the case, we cannot triumph over the Amalekites. Therefore, we must help pastors. Here, Paul writes to the church of Colossae to pray for him and the pastors. There are a few ways on how believers can help pastors. First, we can pray for them. We can help our pastors by praying for them. Second, we can serve pastors in various ways. Third, we can help with materials. Fourth, we can be criticized in their place. When a believer creates a problem with the pastor, we must help the pastor and solve the problem by being criticized instead. There may be people who rebuke and slander pastors. We can help out by taking their places. Fifth, we can help pastors by covering up his flaws. Because pastors are human, they can commit mistakes. 
for example, Noah fell asleep naked. Ham saw this and told his brothers. Shem and Japheth covered their father's mistake by not looking at him and walking backwards. As a result, Ham was cursed. Shem and Japheth were blessed. Even though Ham told the truth, he was cursed. At that time, Noah was a prophet used by God. If someone exposes a prophet's mistakes, it damages the salvation movement. The same goes for us today. Shem and Japheth covered their father's mistakes. And the salvation movement of God was not affected, and thus they were blessed. It is correct for us to cover others' mistakes if it damages the salvation movement and the church. It also says. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. This refers to the gospel. Paul wrote that he was changed, and that means he was imprisoned at the time. Verse four. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. When believers passionately pray for their pastors, the pastors can share the gospel with boldness. When we look at the reviving churches where pastors boldly share God's word. We can see that there are many believers who pray for the pastors. If believers pray a lot, the church will revive, and the believers will receive God's grace. Verse five: Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Outsiders refer to unbelievers. Paul tells us to be wise in the way we act toward outsiders, and make the most of every opportunity. We must not waste time. We are wasting time unless we use it wisely and do the works of God. If we associate with unbelievers without sharing the gospel to them and waste time, our faith will not grow. Thus, it means that believers must be wise and use time wisely to live out their faith. Verse six: Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It says that when believers converse with others, they must always be full of grace, seasoned with salt. There is a saying that one word can remove a huge debt. We can show grace or put a person to test based on the way we talk. Believers must always speak gracefully. Here it says 
salt. Salt is tasteful when it is melted. The saltiness can be tasted. It can do its job when it is melted. In the same way, if salt stays in its form to show off how it looks, it cannot be tasted. The meaning of salt melting is to sacrifice. We must always sacrifice ourselves wherever we are. We must melt. When that happens, we will be able to show our taste even if we are no longer seen. Also, we use salt to preserve fish and to keep it from being spoiled. Also, everyone needs salt. Whether a person is rich or poor, or a king or a beggar, everyone becomes healthy through salt. However, salt is not treated well. No one puts a bag of salt in the living room or under a pillow. It is stored in a storage or in the corner of a room. Believers are not treated well in this world. No one recognizes them. However, salt is needed. Salt can bring out flavor or prevent food from being spoiled. Also, salt is used to make cabbages soft when making kimchi. In the book of Matthew, Jesus said that we are the salt of this world. We must live a life of sacrifice, tastefulness, preservation, and just as salt is used to soften food, we must live harmoniously with our neighbors. In verse 6, it says that our conversation must always be full of grace seasoned with salt. We believers must first live in grace. We must live in truth and by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Everything we say must be graceful and good. Then there will be harmony. We must obey the word of truth through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and practice our faith and speak gracefully with others. There are certain people who always quarrel with others. That is not graceful. That is to be in disharmony with others. They must stop such behavior. We must always speak in faith and grace. Everything we say to others must be full of grace and goodness. It must be peaceful and beneficial. Then we believers can become one and glorify and praise God. We must always practice faith to speak gracefully in the midst of God's grace. Everything we say must be good and graceful to others.
then believers must have fellowship in grace and be helpful to each other. Then in doing so, God will be glorified and praised. Today, on the way to record lectures, I heard worship in the church. Some of the workers gathered in the morning to worship God. When I heard their praises, my heart was at peace. The workers and believers in the church must converse gracefully. Also, we must carefully choose the words we say. This means that we must not only praise God with our lips, but with our lives. Then it says that the Holy Spirit will give us the answers. Now let's discuss the third point, the sending of two people, verses 7 through 9. Verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Here Paul sends Tychicus to the church of Colossae. In verse 9 he says, He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. Tychicus was sent to the church of Colossae with Onesimus. Paul sent this letter through them. It says Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. This was to comfort the hearts of believers. It also says he is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. We can see that Paul always used faithful people. The same goes for pastors. They always use faithful people. If a believer is not faithful, he can be used by Satan and fail. Therefore, believers must be faithful and truthful. They must do everything by faith. Then believers can defeat all schemes of the devil. It says that Tychicus is a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. He was a servant who helped Paul in many ways. Verse 8, I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. The purpose of their trip was to let the believers of Colossae hear news about Paul who was imprisoned. Paul was currently imprisoned in Rome. Hence, the believers of Colossae were worried about Paul. That is why two people were sent to comfort the hearts of the believers. Paul thought of the believers before he thought of himself. He comforted them 
and wanted to put their hearts at peace. In verse 9, Paul writes that he also sent Onesimus. Onesimus was from Colossae. He was Philemon's servant. Philemon chapter 1 verse 10. He was a servant in the house of Philemon. Onesimus ran away after he stole from Philemon. He also committed another crime in Rome, which caused him to end up in a Roman prison. He met Paul in prison and met Jesus Christ. Onesimus became a faithful person after believing in Jesus. He became a great help to Paul because of his devotion. Paul sent Onesimus back to Colossae and introduced him. He did not consider Onesimus a criminal. Paul introduced Onesimus as a faithful believer of Jesus Christ and a dear brother. There are many people who are a great help to the church even though they damaged the church and hurt believers in the past. There are cases in which they are preciously used to spread the gospel. There was a pastor who was a gangster in the past. Even though he was a gangster, after he became a pastor, a lot of people believed in Jesus because of his testimony. Therefore, we must not condemn others because of their past. In the past, Onesimus stole from Philemon. Then he escaped from his master, even though he was a servant. He was then imprisoned in Rome because of another crime he committed. Even though he was a criminal, he became a great help to Paul after he repented. He was used to share the gospel. He became a valuable instrument that God used. The fourth point, introduction, greetings, and a favor, verses 10 through 18. Verse 10, My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Here Paul says, my fellow prisoner, Aristarchus. Aristarchus was from Thessalonica, Acts chapter 20, verse 4. He accompanied Paul in a trip to Jerusalem. This Aristarchus is imprisoned in Rome with Paul. Next, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, appears in the letter. Before, he was useless in the eyes of Paul. However, he was now useful. 
Mark was with Paul on his first mission trip. However, Mark found the trip difficult and left Pamphylia. Acts chapter thirteen, verse four, verse fourteen. Then Paul left on his second mission trip. Barnabas was a cousin of Mark, and he said to Paul, "Let's bring Mark." However, Paul denied his request because Mark ran away during the first trip. Barnabas and Paul had a serious argument because of Mark. Then the two men split ways. This is recorded from Acts chapter fifteen, verse thirty-seven. Mark brought damages for Paul, but was now being introduced as useful. Second Timothy chapter four verse eleven. Even though Mark brought damages in the past, he became a useful person after he repented. Therefore, Paul urged the church of Colossae to accept him. It was a request. To accept those who repented and believed in Jesus, even if they once brought harm to the church. Verse eleven. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. The circumcised ones rejected Paul. They rejected his teachings. Because they did not know the gospel that Paul shared, however, Justice later accepted the gospel and became a faithful helper to Paul. This was a great comfort to Paul. A person who rejected pastors repented. And believed in Jesus and helped pastors, and it became a great comfort for Paul. Thus, if we do not exclude and condemn unbelievers, but instead pray for them while thinking of the gospel, God will surely change them. In verse twelve, Epaphras appears. Verse twelve, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God. Mature and fully assured. Epaphras was a believer at Colossae. He visited Paul, who was imprisoned in Rome. He also taught the believers of Colossae. When he was in Rome, he always prayed for the church. He prayed that the believers of Colossae would firmly stand on the truth. Verse thirteen. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you, and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Paul tried to inform the believers of Colossae 
that Epaphras worked hard for the church. He truly worked hard for the church. It is good for us to acknowledge those who work hard in the church. Epaphras worked hard and helped Paul while he was in prison. We must also acknowledge those who work hard for the church and for pastors. Verse 14 Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas sends greetings. <coughs> Here Paul introduced Luke who was a doctor. He also accepted and helped Paul. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. <coughs> Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 11. It says, Only Luke is with me. He faithfully helped until Paul was martyred for the gospel. It says in verse 14, Demas sends greetings. Demas was a faithful worker who helped Paul. However, his faith later became weak and he ran away to Thessalonica leaving Paul behind. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 Paul wrote that Demas send greetings because Demas had not run away yet. Verse 15 Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Paul urged the believers of Colossae to greet the brothers at Laodicea, which was located near Colossae. He said, and to Nympha and the church in her house. In the times of the early church, Believers gathered in homes. Verse 16 After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Paul further says, to let the Laodiceans read this letter as well. Our churches must read and learn from the Bible. We must share it with other members of the church. Verse 17 Tell Archippus, See to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. Archippus here was Philemon's son who became a pastor. It also says, See to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. We must carefully fulfill our calling by acknowledging that our duties were given to us from God. Verse 18 I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Because Paul could not see well, 
he greeted people in his own hand, just as we sign at the end of our letters today. Paul also wrote, "Remember my chains." This was to remind believers that he was suffering for the gospel. Even if we face sufferings, we must be faithful until the end. No matter what sufferings we face, we must triumph with faith by cooperating with other believers. Lastly, Paul blessed the people by praying. Grace be with you. We must be victorious believers who faithfully triumph through God's grace. Here we will conclude the seventeenth lecture on the prison epistles. Thank you.